So um, I'm really pleased that uh, IAS has chosen this theme of uh, alcohol and human rights as a topic for the last in the series of sustainability. Uh, it's an area that I've worked in for some time, and I believe it offers us a lot of leverage in order to ensure alcohol policies that are protective of human health and of the environment. Um, Birgit Toby has highlighted in a 2018 article that the human rights of children to a tobacco-free environment was a missing voice in the public policy debates on tobacco. And I believe that you can make a similar assertion about the alcohol policy space in that we are potentially missing a really great opportunity to leverage greater protections, both for vulnerable groups and for the population at large from practices of an industry that has largely put profits from the sale and distribution of alcohol ahead of public health. There've been a number of reports over the past decade which have highlighted the human rights implications along the full value chain of alcohol production in countries such as mine, South Africa, and more recently in Italy, where they've identified forced labor, low wages, excessive working hours, poor health and safety conditions, sexual harassment, and inadequate housing and sanitation in reports from Oxfam, Human Rights Watch, War and Want, and in an excellent documentary by Tom Heinemann on the South African wine industry. These links, as I understand, will be available through IAS after the discussions of this meeting. But today we are going further than just looking at human rights violations occurring in wine production and distribution. We have three excellent speakers whom I will introduce, who are going to examine aspects of how human rights are impacted by the practices of the alcohol industry all along the value chain and what we might be able to do about it. So the first speaker is Olivia van Beemen, who's an investigative journalist who um, wrote, uh, he'll be speaking about his book, Heineken in Africa. Uh, he has uh, written uh, the book uh, after six years of journalistic research, over 400 interviews, visits to 13 African countries where Heineken is operating. The book's been translated into multiple languages uh, and he's won a prestigious award in Dutch journalism, the Tegel, as well as being nominated for several other prizes. As I said to Olivia in the few minutes preceding the meeting, I've just received in my inbox an offer of funding from Heineken for uh, funding uh, maternal and child health and water and sanitation activities. So it's very timely to hand over to Olivia to share with us his uh, perspectives. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Leslie. Um, uh, yeah, my name is Olivier van Beemen. I'm an, uh, an independent journalist. Uh, I don't see any conflict of interest, uh, I guess. Uh, I would like to point out that I am, um, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm a, I'm a journalist, so I'm not an activist. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about uh, my research on, on Heineken in Africa. Uh, let me tell you a quick word about the company Heineken itself. It's the world's number two beer company behind uh, AB InBev, uh, and they're based in, in Amsterdam, uh, like I am myself. So that makes it convenient. They're just a quick bicycle ride away from my home. It's a very large company. Their revenue last year was 26.5 billion euros. They are almost back at their pre-COVID level. Uh, they made a net profit last year of 2 billion euros. Heineken claims to be the most international beer brand in the world. These days, uh, uh, AB InBev, uh, from, uh, from, yeah, from they're, they're actually Belgian, Brazilian, but they are very large in the US as well. They're really trying to push Budweiser to become a very international brand, but Heineken is, I think, still more widely available. Heineken is a truly a uh, globalized company. It's, it's not just the future. Uh, Heineken's most lucrative markets uh, these days are Mexico, Vietnam, and Nigeria. Um, Heineken is not just uh, the brand Heineken itself. They have uh, around the world, they have around 300 different brands of beer, also cider. Strongbow is a, is a cider brand. Uh, Tiger is, is a, in, in Asia, a big brand, Kingfisher in India. So um, even if it doesn't always look like Heineken, it's, uh, it's often still Heineken that's behind it. And it's interesting to notice that uh, in some African countries, Heineken is also the manufacturer of, uh, of the Coca-Cola products, uh, Fanta, Coca-Cola itself, Sprite. 
So Heineken has created a very good uh, narrative for Africa. It claims to be good for development and economic growth, um, and it has uh, impact studies to sustain that. Uh, they, could, uh, they claim to be creating jobs. In reality, what I found out is that they're at least destroying the same number of jobs, and uh, they also do a lot of harm to economies. So it's um, the reality is a lot more nuanced, of course. At one point, a human rights director, a former human rights director of Heineken told me that his company tries to behave like an island of perfection in a sea of misery. Um, so that sea of misery would be Africa and, and Heineken, uh, he, yeah, he, this, this person sees Heineken in Africa as, as the island of perfection. So he was referring to the to the logistical problems, to the poverty in Africa, to, uh, to many obstacles. But Heineken is somehow, um, yeah, uh, winning or, or uh, sur yeah, surviving in this very difficult uh, environment and it's an island of perfection. So they also have slogans that go very well with the, uh, those claims. Brewing a better world and growing together in Africa is, is what they often use in their communication. So like uh, Leslie London said, uh, the investigation took more than six years, 400 interviews with all sorts of people, like from the president of Burundi until uh, people who sell the beer, people who grow the ingredients that go in the beer. Uh, I went to all the countries where, where Heineken was, uh, is, is active uh, in Africa. And um, what was interesting uh, is that at one point, People also, when I had published about it, people from Heineken started, former people from Heineken started to approach me and came up with new information, which was very useful for the international, international version of the book. What's always important to me is to, to point out that to me, this is a case study. Uh, it's not my purpose to single out Heineken. Uh, I think that if you look at AB InBev, at Diageo, another big competitor to Heineken in Africa, if you, if you do in-depth research on them, you will probably find many similar uh, conclusions. Um, Heineken's footprint in Africa. Um, Nigeria, I mentioned it already, is very important to Heineken. It's about half of, of all their uh, sales and benefits in, uh, in Africa. They're very big in Central Africa. South Africa is becoming really important. It's, Heineken's market share is not so uh, big there yet. But um, the, uh, South Africans drink a lot more on average than people in other African countries. So that makes it a very important uh, market for Heineken as well. Ethiopia is, is going really well. And also in Northern Africa and Muslim, uh, predominantly Muslim countries, Heineken is, is still doing uh, very good business. So all this led to books and translations and, and a lot of stories in the international press. And uh, let me tell you a bit about the importance of Africa. Um, many of you have probably heard about the whole rising Africa rhetoric. Um, the, the fact is that uh, even though you can be very critical about this, 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 uh, this narrative, that many countries are doing better since let's say um, early 2000s. And um, so big companies see Africa really as part of their, 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 their strategy to, to make, uh, make more profits. It's important to notice that for Heineken, it's not just the future that is uh, so bright. Uh, it has had a very long and profitable history on, uh, on this continent. Uh, it's been present since the late 1900s. It's been brewing beer locally since the 1930s. Um, even at the darkest moments of, of, of the African uh, history, of, of some of those countries' uh, history, when there were coup d'etat, when there were uh, civil wars, when there were uh, was it genocides, uh, Heineken always managed to, to, uh, to, to get money out of the continent and most of the times to remain profitable as well. And in our time, it's, it's already doing great business. So it's not just the future, it's these days, Africa is very profitable. According to the latest available numbers uh, on, on the African continent, Heineken's revenue and volume are nearly 15%. So 
Africa as being part of, of, uh, of, of the global revenue is, is about 15% and the volume, uh, the liters of beer sold is also about 15%. But if you look at the profits, the African profits are almost 21% uh, of the total. So that means that, that Africa is, is more than 40% more uh, lucrative. It's more profitable on any beer sold on average in Africa, Heineken earns more than 40% more than in the rest of the world, according to this uh, latest available results. What's also very important to Heineken is that um, it's, it's supposed, yeah, it's, it's considered to be a learning school for future executives and especially Kinshasa is, is the, both the, the, the current CEO and, and the former CEO, they have earned their stripes in Kinshasa. So it's basically for that city, the capital of the DR Congo, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere. It's, uh, it's not New York for, for Heineken, but uh, Kinshasa. Heineken and human rights, the, the topic, the theme uh, of this uh, discussion today. Um, I will give you three examples of, of Heineken and, and, uh, and serious human rights um, violations. I'll come, to, I'll, I'll come to talk about the collaboration with dictators and uh, uh, yeah, yeah. the case of Burundi will show collaboration with a dictator. And uh, I also claim that, that Heineken is allegedly complicit in, in crimes against humanity. In South Africa, I'll briefly talk about expo exploitation of, 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 of personnel, of staff, and uh, I'll get to talk about uh, sexual abuse of promotion women. Um, I thought it was interesting uh, today to add a small slide about Russia as well, which is uh, of course very uh, up to date. Um, I haven't seen, Heineken is very big in Russia as well. It's the number two or three brewing company. And uh, many companies, uh, countries, of course, everyone is sanctioning Russia because of uh, what the invasion of, of Ukraine. I haven't seen any Heineken communications uh, yet. They have, I think, seven or eight breweries in, uh, in Russia. Carlsberg, which is the market leader in, in Russia, decided uh, last week already to suspend its operations uh, in Russia. Uh, but Heineken, uh, no, nothing yet, for as far as I'm aware. And uh, I, I quickly had a look uh, how important they are for, for Russia. And they, they proudly stated in, in a document of two, 2016 that they contributed 300 million euros of tax uh, contributions uh, to the Russian state and to the local uh, state authorities, so that's very considerable. And this, and the photo you're seeing here is, is um, from the, uh, the Olympic Winter Games in Sochi, where Heineken always builds a Holland Heineken house where, uh, where it's people, where, where Dutch medal winners are being celebrated. And this, this photo is still haunting uh, our king and, and the queen who you see here with Putin uh, drinking a beer. Yeah, this is uh, kind of what Dutch business uh, looks like uh, at its worst. But uh, let me get back to, to Africa. And Mostly the they touch you at intimate places like your butt, your boobs. Yeah. We assumed that you were there for, like, you are probably not selling a brand, you're selling yourself. Most of them are these girls, and um, they have to sleep with manager and customers to, for, for them to keep their job. So that was a quick, uh, small video about promotion women in, in Kenya. Um, the promotion women are young women who... Uh, go into bars, into clubs to sell beer, uh, to, to promote beer, basically, to promote Heineken brands. This has been an issue uh, in Southeast Asia. It was an issue in the 2000s already. And I uncovered that it was still going on in, um, in, in many African countries. And I also uh, revealed that the, the former CEO had a, had a, well, what he calls himself, a consensual love affair with a promotion woman. Um, so that didn't uh, make him a very credible person to attack this, this problematic, uh, this, this issue. 
Um, and he actually, in an interview later, he said that for him, Me Too is a Western phenomenon. So he was implying that uh, if, if, if this sort of, uh, yeah, if, if these women, while doing their job, they are often being harassed. They often sleep with, with their bosses, like, like the, the women were saying in the video. They, uh, they end up in prostitution because their wages are so, uh, so low. So um, the, the CEO uh, commented that uh, to him, Me Too is, is rather a Western phenomenon. And they basically then promised to, to after my revelations, to stop the activity uh, if, if they couldn't guarantee good working conditions. But then I went to Kenya to check if this was true. And that's where I made this, this, this report. So they hadn't kept their promise at all. And then the CEO came with some sort of a, an excuse. We are not responsible. It's they, the Heineken is hiring agencies to, to uh, they're not employing them themselves, which means that the women are cheaper, they are more flexible, but they also say that the, respons the responsibility in the end is, is at the agency level and not at the Heineken level. Heineken in Burundi, I see that time is going pretty fast. Uh, so I, uh, I might resume it. Uh, uh, yeah, I might make it a bit shorter. Uh, Heineken in Burundi is, is uh, yeah, it's, it's huge. Heineken, uh, Burundi is the poorest country in the world these days. And Heineken as a beer company has, um, represents 10% of the GDP and, and GDP and more than 30% of tax revenues. And it's interesting because Heineken often says, and it's also it will be interesting to see what they have to say about Russia in this in this case, that it's not us that control how tax money is being spent. So we pay our taxes in the Netherlands and we pay our taxes in Burundi, but in Burundi the government is using it, like in Russia, it's using this money to uh, to commit uh, human rights violations, crimes against uh, against humanity even. So um, many uh, human rights lawyers these days that say, say that Heineken indeed has a responsibility if they know that the money they pay um, in a certain country is being abused for, for these sort of purposes, it gives them a responsibility. And uh, well, in, in Burundi, it was even, uh, what happened was that uh, for a long, for, for, uh, since two, two, 2015, Heineken actually has one of its, uh, one of the most important judges of the country, um, who is, uh, also the chairman of, uh, of the local Heineken operation. Um, this, this was given to this chairman as a sort of a reward because he, uh, he allowed the, the president to have a third term. Well, it's, it's a bit of a, <laughs> it's a complicated story, but uh, Heineken ended up with, with uh, in, its, uh, in its board, they have one of the most important judges of the country and uh, they just, um, yeah um deal dealt with it with this situation and heineken often says that well if we leave such a country as burundi there there will be nothing left we're at a little bit uh, we're a bit of hope but burundi is, is now as i said the poorest country of the world and with all the marketing that heineken is, is spending there um burundians uh they like the beer so much that 17 percent of the disposable income in, in in this country and of course it's not only due to heineken but 17 percent of the income goes to uh to alcohol and tobacco so that's it's it's incredible okay see my time is past uh thanks very much uh we're going to move on to dr sarah hill who is a global health scholar whose work focuses on social and commercial determinants of health and the impact on population health and health equity she's at the sydney school of public health she previously was director of global health policy unit at the university of edinburgh uh, she's a collaborator in the spectrum research consortium a member of the lancet commission on gender and global health she's going to be talking to us about uh, gender issues in the way industry presents itself and uh, corporate social responsibility. So over to you, Sarah. Thanks very much. So I'm going to talk about um, the alcohol industry and its engagement with gender. And this really draws on broader work I've done looking at commercial determinants of health from a gendered perspective, but it ties in really nicely with this emphasis of this seminar on human rights. Um, and just before I start, just to acknowledge that I'm living and working in Sydney, I'm on the land that was traditionally owned by the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, so my respects to them. 
Um, so gender and the social determinants of health, I'll say a little bit about the kind of conceptual framework I'm using, but then the really interesting bit is talking about how does the alcohol industry engage with gender? And I'll show a number of examples of that uh, to sort of demonstrate both how they play around with gendered norms, they also create or um, um, reinforce some really problematic gender norms, um, but they also use gender as a marketing strategy and as a way of trying to demonstrate their own legitimacy and as sort of responsible corporate stakeholders. Um, and more fundamentally, they, their activities in terms of global expansion, market expansion into emerging, emerging economies often have detrimental effects in terms of gender equity. Um, so from a health and human rights perspective, um, these are, are highly problematic behaviours, even though the, the industry is very good at putting a much more um, palatable image of itself forward, often drawing on gender empowerment um, uh, CSR activities. So just to briefly say that um, I'm using gender here as a social construction or a social system that reflects culturally defined roles, responsibilities and dynamics really associated with the expectations of masculinity or femininity. Um, and I, I tend to use the social determinants of health a lot in my work. And so I quite like this framework from Hayes et al that talks about how gender interacts with the social determinants of health. And really what they're saying is that um, gender shapes a whole lot of factors that influence health. It's not the only thing that shapes those factors. Um, there's a lot of other aspects of social location, such as class, race or ethnicity, um, that, that are also important, but, it, but it's a really significant one, particularly in a global scale. And this is relevant from a human rights perspective for a number of reasons. Um, so first of all, gender is often used as a basis for discussing what we might think of as negative rights or the absence of um, discrimination or, or gender-based um, maltreatment or violence. So the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination both essentially talk about rights and freedoms um, as being existing free from any distinction or um, discrimination on the basis um, of, of sex or, in, or um, probably gender is, is implicit in, in the UN Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. Um, but I also think that the International Convention on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights is really relevant and perhaps encourage us to think about rights in a slightly different way, which is positive rights. So rather than thinking about the absence of discrimination or the absence of gender-based violence, it's essentially saying that um, human beings all have this entitlement to have the, their economic, social and cultural rights realised and also their political and, and civil rights. And clearly that's a really aspirational um, statement as all international human rights treaties are, but I think it's also relevant from, a, from thinking about gender and health because in a sense, um, uh, the realisation of positive rights is, 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 is a more, a more radical aim, I suppose, and, and perhaps encourages us to think about the impacts of the alcohol industry on rights in a, in a slightly broader way. So how does the alcohol industry engage with gender? I'm going to talk about sort of three key areas where we see this. And the first is in shaping preferences and playing on gender norms. And so there's a lot of really um, stark examples from marketing. So I'll show you some examples from over the last few decades. Um, but I think there's also really interesting things in how the, the alcohol industry plays on issues to do with gender, especially women's empowerment, as a way of trying to promote a positive image of themselves and present themselves as responsible corporate partners. And then finally, in a much less visible way, there's the ways in which they influence some of the structural determinants of health. So thinking about the way in which alcohol has often been marketed, there's lots of examples, of course, of how this plays on gendered norms. And um, those have tended to change over time, which tells us interesting things both about the fluid nature of gender and gender norms, but also about industry's strategies and how these adapt over time to um, accommodate changes in sort of social expectations around gender. So these ads both come from the United States from the 1940s and a bit later through the, um, the, mid, the mid 60s. And in these ads, you really see this idea of alcohol consumption being a largely masculinized activity associated with different classes, so beer drinking for working class men and um, spirits for, for businessmen, and, and women here portrayed largely as hostesses. So this um, 
probably not too surprising for the period, but obviously there's a, um, a reinforcement, I suppose, of some fairly traditional gendered norms. Um, interestingly, in The Feminine Mystique, Betty Friedan talks about the crucial function of women from a kind of political economy perspective. And that's reflected, I think, in a lot of this advertising. So she's saying the really important role that women serve from the perspective of um, corporations is that they're housewives who are responsible for buying, doing the weekly shopping. So essentially, there are ways in which corporations can um, engage with that role that increases the chance of, of women buying their products, not necessarily for themselves, but on behalf of an entire household. So that sense of women sort of being the, the ones that act on behalf of the whole of a household in terms of domestic consumption um, is really interesting. And, and we see that reflected in the kinds of advertising campaigns that dominated in the 1960s. So here, these ads for um, from the United States for Budweiser and for Miller, both of them portraying the the woman or the wife in this very idealized domestic goddess sense, again, men tending to be the recipients or the consumers, um, but very much the sense of alcohol consumption being a very sort of wholesome thing that takes place as part of this sort of um, family get together. So it's, it's, um, it's, it's portrayed in a very kind of um, motherhood and apple pie kind of way. Of course, that changes over time. And here we see the way in which industry marketing um, adapts and reflects some of the fluidity in gender norms within society. So in the 1970s, we have the sexual revolution, and now we have a very different kind of marketing, which is firstly, for the first time, probably explicitly targeting women as actual consumers rather than um, just serving the alcohol, but it also associates alcohol with this idea of both sexual attractiveness, but also sexual freedoms and perhaps um, providing a kind of permissive role that would allow women to do things that otherwise might be seen as, as being um, in, inappropriate in terms of their role. And even more disturbingly, I think we see there's lots and lots of examples of these advertisements that are essentially equating alcohol with very attractive women and almost always they're beautiful blonde women this seems to be a really common pattern and here I think there's some interesting things going on both because this advertising is clearly targeted at men rather than women and there's a very explicit objectification of women but there's also a kind of really interesting thing going on in terms of playing on masculinity which is almost the sense of alcohol being seen as a substitute or providing something that, that the man can have ownership and mastery of, even if it's not realistic for him to obtain that status in relation to a, a very beautiful woman. Um, and then again, moving along into the 1980s, here we see again another change in industry advertising. And, and of course, here we've seen the influence of um, women's liberation, the sort of second wave feminism, and we see alcohol companies responding to that in the way they advertise their products. So products very much being associated with um, emancipation and um, seen as kind of celebrating um, female empowerment. And one of the really interesting ways in which this is used is not just as a marketing ploy, but as a way of trying to rehabilitate the industry's own image. So this advertisement from 2019, um, I think is a really fascinating one because the company's advertisers have gone back and found an image that they used in 1962. And they've produced a kind of pastiche or a replica of it, but they've kind of modernized it. So where the woman was a housewife serving beer to her husband when he came home from a hard day in the office, she's now doing beer on her own right and she's there by herself with her, with her dog. So it's kind of this, and in fact, the, the advertisement appears not just as an advertisement, but as a piece of sort of corporate propaganda really. So alongside the ad was this, um, this text that talked about how this ad was produced in honor of International Women's Day, um, that the company is seeking to portray, better portray balance and empowerment in their advertising. And so they're, they're presenting themselves as being very gender progressive uh, while also uh, obviously selling their brand. And we see a whole raft of activities in terms of corporate social responsibility that engage with gender and particularly women's empowerment in terms of companies trying to present themselves as having this legitimate image. Um, so the, the Jane Walker campaign has a really interesting history um, and we also see a number of initiatives evolving around International Women's Day. So um, Diageo in this case is um, trying to celebrate women's leadership. And um, Olivia talked about the role of alcohol companies in 
more resource poor settings and there's a number of CSR campaigns that have taken place. Um, the, the two that I've highlighted here are from Cambodia and from South Africa. So the Cambodian campaign is, picks up on something that Olivia talked about, which is essentially the use of very young women as um, hostesses in hospitality venues or as they're also called beer gardens and um, Diageo in this case have partnered with a UK-based um, uh, not-for-profit organisation here UK and uh, participating in a number of supporting what they say are a number of campaigns designed to empower women one of which includes um, uh, trying allegedly trying to support the, the position of of these women who work in um, beer gardens in Cambodia there's there's no suggestion of it's a very downstream intervention there's no suggestion that maybe these it's not a great thing that these young women are working in these beer gardens or that you know there's this is a context that's highly likely to lead to um, sexual harassment uh, instead they're presenting themselves as being on the side essentially of these of these very young women and really really interesting is the I think the the no excuse campaign associated with cow and black label in South Africa. I'm sure Leslie will have thoughts on this as well, which I think again is a really interesting example of a company seeking to perhaps rehabilitate its image by taking on support for a cause against gender-based violence in this case, which almost requires a level of cognitive dissonance um, because of course the consumption of alcohol is a major driver of domestic violence. And so I think it's almost a way of um, the company removing itself from responsibility in relation to this, which perhaps is similar to some of the things that Olivia was talking about in relation to, um, to women in, um, in, in, in hospitality venues. Um, and even in high income countries as well, there's a lot of um, what we'd call um, social aspect organizations where these companies are involved also in, in public health education campaigns. And again, I think the real feature of these is the way in which they tend to reinforce this idea of the solution to alcohol based problems being people taking individual responsibility. And I think it's also really interesting to think about how gender is used in these campaigns. So the contrast between the kind of wholesome girl next door drinking her Guinness and the, the kind of irresponsible slut effect effectively, you know, out on the town and um, behaving in a very unseemly way, I think is a really problematic way of trying to present images around responsible drinking. So if we ask ourselves, how does the alcohol industry engage with gender? I think we can see in quite visible ways that the, the industry uses gender in its marketing, both to encourage um, consumption, but also in ways that potentially reinforce problematic gender norms, although they're also very adept at trying to show themselves as gender progressive where that becomes um, expedient. We also see that they're using that they're engaging with gender in ways that help manage their corporate image. Um, and then finally, I'm going to say a little bit about the food area, which is how I see the alcohol industry is influencing the structural determinants of health or, or undermining gender equity at that most sort of upstream level. And here I'm really drawing on the work of feminist political economists who talk about the ways in which um, market society really undervalues and underplays the role the role of women. Um, so there's a sense that if we have a, um, if society is organized in such a way that we're privileging the role of um, corporate actors, particularly transnational companies, we end up with a society where roles and skills that are traditionally associated with masculinity end up being very well remunerated and those that are more traditionally associated with female labor end up being often not remunerated at all. So um, there's a kind of bias, if you like, a gender-based bias in the way that the um, economic system works. But they also point out that um, the loss of the role of the state, the sort of hollowing out of the state and a lot of public services tends to have a particularly profound impact on girls and women who are more likely to, to, to um, to have their life circumstances circumscribed by things like lacking access to healthcare or um, um, good access to education. And I think clearly the alcohol industry is only one company that's involved in this. And here I'm really talking very much about large transnational companies rather than smaller companies. But I think it's also worth remembering that it plays an active role in trying to reinforce the privileging of, um, of, of market freedoms. So we see lots of examples of um, alcohol companies seeking to shape policy debates, presenting themselves as partners um, with states, um, using ideas of good governance as a way of um, 
making claims about them, them being legitimate stakeholders and needing to have their concerns incorporated in the development of policy. But we know that these are tactics that are used to delay or prevent the um, regulation, and that also these companies exert a lot of influence, partly because they're such significant economic players. So they're typically based in very high income countries, which then also have a, um, a vested interest. The governments of those countries tend to have, um, be very influenced by the, the prospect of, of losing that economic base. And that gives them a, quite a lot of leverage in the context of international trade disputes and so forth. So there's lots of ways in which the alcohol companies are really actively seeking to reinforce that market privilege. And um, I, I guess, prevent us from moving towards a, a, a model of society that might balance out um, those more economic goals against other, other types of social goals. Um, and as part of that, there's, there's been a lot of work done that shows how alcohol companies have very actively sought to expand into new and emerging markets. And part of that, of course, is that it provides them with a new set of consumers, but it also means that they're acting in contexts that are often less regulated. And so in those contexts, we see some really problematic um, activities in relation to, to gender and gender equity, um, things that would, would be unlikely to, 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 to happen in higher income countries simply because they'd be open to more scrutiny. So I've talked about the beer gardens in Cambodia. The, um, the picture on, on the right is from um, uh, the Philippines and it's an advertisement for a brandy which says in the local language, have you tasted a 15 year old? Um, so it, I think there's, it's not, you don't need a lot of imagination really to sort of see some of the, the problematic aspects of those, of those kinds of activities. So as I was saying, I think that um, behind the more visible ways in which the alcohol industry engages with gender, there's a whole lot of that goes on in a less visible way that reinforces um, market privilege in ways that effectively undermine um, women's empowerment, even at the same time that the industry is often claiming to be promoting that in its um, CSR campaigns. And that's sort of reflected in a whole lot of work that just demonstrates the ways in which um, women's women are less advantaged in terms of those structural determinants of health. And I focus here on, on things at a um, fairly simplistic level, but there's, of course there's an intersectionality, so it's particularly acute for women um, in low and middle income countries where uh, these disparities are particularly profound and there's um, often a, a very profound lo loss of autonomy and a loss of autonomy and loss of human rights. So, so just to summarise, um, my analysis is saying that the alcohol industry engages very um, consciously and deliberately with gender, that they do this in ways that reinforce um, a market society and that this effectively increases gender inequities. That's not necessarily the, the reason that they're doing these things. They're doing it to protect their, um, their profits and to protect their own interests, but that's the inevitable um, byproduct of that. And so I think we see from a social determinants perspective, the ways in which the activities of the alcohol industry are undermining gender equity at a number of different levels. And as I say, the more visible of those are often the ways in which marketing plays on gender and gender norms to encourage um, consumption for women and for other disadvantaged gender groups, but also very actively reinforcing and often helping create problematic gender norms. But we also see how industry activity shapes broader environments and, and adds to this kind of very um, uh, dominant neoliberal paradigm in ways that systematically disadvantages women, particularly in the global south. Um, and alongside that, they're often engaging in, in things that are designed to promote their corporate image, but that also reinforce ideas of personal responsibility, which fits really well with that kind of market-based approach to things. Um, so finally, just to say that from a human rights perspective, I think that there are some really significant impacts here, not only in terms of negative impacts on human rights, the, the evidence of, of, of discrimination and of activities that may um, increase the risks of gender-based violence, but perhaps more fundamentally that it undermines the realization of positive um, human rights, including um, the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural and, and civil and political rights, not only for women, I have focused very much on women in this presentation, but I think also for men and for other gender groups as well. Okay, thanks so much, Sarah. I think uh, it's really excellent to dive into a focused area of rights. And I think it segues very nicely into uh, Amandine's presentation 
uh, since we talk about the question of positive rights, and I think uh, Amandine will pick that up. Just to introduce that, uh, Amandine is the Professor of Law at the University of Liverpool. Um, she established the Law and Non-Communicable Disease Research Unit, which regularly advises international organizations, NGOs, public health agencies, governments. She's worked closely with WHO, UNICEF, the EU. Uh, she's written, written numerous policy reports, have developed several training courses. Uh, she's a scientific advisor to the European Public Health Alliance, sits on many advisory groups. So over to you, Amandine, to follow through on how we think about the potential of rights-based approaches in addressing commercial practices of the alcohol industry. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Leslie, and uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak today. I'm delighted to be here. Um, so, as you will know, in January this year, the Executive Board of the World Health Organization approved a draft global action plan for alcohol for 2000, 2022 to 2030, which calls for a human rights approach to the development and implementation of alcohol policies at all levels. And in particular, the Global Action Plan provides that, quote, protection from alcohol-related harm and access to prevention and treatment of uh, AUD within health system contributes to the fulfillment of the right to the highest attainable standard of health. So on the one hand, this statement is encouraging as an explicit reference to the need for a human rights-based approach. And as such, it is in line with other UN strategic documents, including the WHO Global Action Plan for the Prevention and Control of NCDs 2013-2030, and the third UN Political Declaration on NCDs of 2018. On the other hand, this statement is not particularly helpful to say the least in that it does not explain at all what contribution human rights can make in this policy area. This lack of rigor is perhaps not surprising considering the paucity of academic research on the role that human rights-based approaches can play in the prevention and treatment of alcohol-related harm. The allocation of more resources to the understanding of the barriers and opportunities for better alcohol policy is long overdue, as the action plan itself recognizes clearly. I argue that one of the opportunities that the action plan does not list is precisely the potential of a human rights-based approach. And I would urge the World Health Organization to work with states and other UN agencies to promote the framing of alcohol-related harm, not only as a global health issue, but also as a major human rights concern, as it has done for other NCD risk factors, and in particular, tobacco or unhealthy diets. There is no reason why alcohol should stand in stark contrast to these other risk factors for non-communicable diseases. I would also like to note that if human rights bodies have made some passing references to alcohol in various general comments or country monitoring reports, they have not been systematic in their analysis either. So what I'm proposing to do in this very short presentation is to unpack some of the elements characterizing human rights-based approaches and reflect on their relevance to better alcohol control policies. And in the interest of time and considering my own expertise, I will focus only on the prevention of alcohol related harm, non, not on its treatment, nor on other issues already discussed by uh, Olivier and Sarah. So many definitions have been proposed of the concept of a human rights based approach, and all of them highlight to varying degrees three core elements. Firstly, these approaches are grounded in international human rights law, drawing on global and regional treaties and conventions. Secondly, international human rights treaties and conventions recognize human rights to all people as rights holders and place corresponding obligations, legal obligations on states 
as duty bearers. And thirdly, and less often discussed, human rights-based approaches require that mechanisms are established to ensure that the human rights of right holders are realized and duty bearers are held accountable when rights are not respected, protected, and fulfilled. So the first element that human rights-based approaches are grounded in human rights law, this first element requires that we identify the relevant rights that are implicated when reflecting on preventing alcohol-related harm. The WHO Global Action Plan specifically mentions the right to the enjoyment of a highest attainable standard of health, which is enshrined in the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, as well as in the Convention on the Rights of the Child, to give two prominent examples only. But many other rights are relevant too, not least the right to life, survival, and development, the right to information and education, the right to be protected from harmful media content, the right to leisure, play, and rest, the right to privacy, the right to be free from exploitation, the right to be protected from violence, the right to non-discrimination, etc. And the list goes on uh, and also includes specific rights that may be granted to particularly vulnerable groups of people. For example, the UN Convention on the Rights of a Child mandates that states uphold the best interest of a child as a primary consideration in all their actions concerning children. And the African Charter, as we've discussed uh, Africa in particular earlier on, the African Charter goes further and refers to the best interest of a child as the, not a, the primary consideration. So you see this principle is particularly important when balancing competing rights and interests and requires that the best interest of a child shall not be considered on the same level as other consideration, such as industry profit margins. Secondly, it is necessary to reflect on the obligations of states under human rights treaties and conventions. Now it is clear and widely acknowledged that the obligation to protect human rights that rest on states requires that they adopt a preventive approach and regulate the commercial determinants of health, including what they have not done well everywhere, the, the alcohol industry. However, listing rights is not sufficient in and of itself, nor is highlighting that states have a legal obligation to regulate third parties that fail to respect human rights. We must give content to these rights and obligations and carefully flesh them out if we are to establish what individuals are entitled to and what states are expected to do under international human rights law. In the 2018 report, we wrote for UNICEF on a child rights-based approach to full marketing, with in particular Nikhil Gokhani, who is also on this call, we argued that the interpretation of human rights should be guided by the best available evidence. The same argument applies in relation to alcohol control. And importantly, references to the best available evidence are recurring in the WHO Global Action Plan on Alcohol. A dynamic interpretation is called for so that human rights treaties and conventions that may have been adopted decades ago evolve and remain fit for purpose in March 2022 to address the problems of the day. I would like to suggest here that the best buys and rec other recommended measures in global health can indirectly acquire legal force through the interpretation of relevant human rights instruments that are themselves legally binding on states. For example, if there is evidence that health warnings promote consumer awareness and understanding of the risks with which alcohol consumption entails, then such health warnings should be adopted by states to protect the rights negatively affected by alcohol consumption. Similarly, if there is evidence that um, stepwise limited marketing restrictions fail to effectively protect children or others from uh, alcohol-related harm, from exposure to uh, unhealthy um, alcohol marketing, then 
the regulatory framework should be amended to include digital marketing and be more comprehensive to limit investment shifts from regulated to unregulated media. I would also like to emphasize that states can fulfill their human rights obligation individually or collectively. And this raises interesting questions regarding the compatibility with their human rights obligations or the legal or political challenges that some states, often from the global north with a strong alcohol industry, have mounted against other states, often from the global south, particularly at the Technical Barriers to Trade Committee of the World Trade Organization. And the examples of Thailand and Kenya are well documented, and I will draw your attention to the article that Pepita Barlow and other colleagues published on this issue in The Lancet last month. The obligations that states derive from international trade and investment law must be interpreted in light of their human rights obligations. In particular, the key question of whether a measure is unnecessarily trade restrictive must be determined on the basis that the best available evidence calls for effective alcohol labeling, alcohol health warnings, the regulation of uh, claims on alcoholic beverages, other alcohol marketing restrictions, minimum unit pricing, and taxation on alcoholic beverages, et cetera, et cetera. We have learned a lot from the infamous Scotch whiskey challenge to the innovative minimum unit pricing legislation Scotland adopted in 2012 and implemented in 2018. The fact that the public health community is becoming more familiar with international trade and investment arguments and is better prepared to engage with such arguments is to be celebrated and encouraged. Such engagement will certainly assist with the framing of measures in light of evidence and applicable legal tests and further increase their chances of being successfully defended. As we have argued in the UNICEF report and more recently in a book co-edited on childhood obesity, no legal argument prevents the reconciliation of trade, human rights and public health imperatives. Quite the contrary, notwithstanding what industry may suggest. Nevertheless, the constant legal and political challenges mounted by industry actors or states sympathetic to industry interest to effective NCD prevention measures call for a paradigm shift. Any human rights-based approach can promote this shift. As I mentioned in my introduction, a human rights-based approach does not only call for compliance with human rights standards, it also calls for compliance with human rights principles, and in particular, the principle of accountability. States, individually and collectively, must be held accountable for their action, or often in this case, their failure to act. To this effect, they must set processes in place, allowing right holders either individually or collectively through civil society organizations to claim their rights and be compensated should these rights be violated. These processes can be judicial or extrajudicial, for example, an ombudsperson or other agency. And the more the state empowers civil society, the more one can hope for change. Another point which is very clearly highlighted in the Global Action Plan. The principles of participation and empowerment are key principles underpinning human rights-based approaches too. But participation, let's be very clear, does not mean blindly delegating the responsibility for better health to industry actors, entrusting them with self-regulation of harmful commercial practices from which they are known to profit hugely. Such an approach is not compatible with a human rights-based approach, as various human rights bodies have repeatedly said. And the recent article by May Fanshark, Mark Petticrew, and other colleagues on the presence of the industry in UK schools, settings where children gather that should be specifically protected, sheds further light of what, on what we have known for a long time, 
that conflicts of interest and undue interference from industry actors must be acknowledged, exposed, and avoided. And this would be in line with the principle of transparency that also underpins human rights-based approaches. Such approaches put state in the driving seat, a position they have often relinquished for far too long to the in advantage of industry profit and to the detriment of human health. So ultimately, the public health community perhaps has more cards to play than it did a few years ago to address the structural determinants of health. The discourse, at least, seems to be changing in the right direction. And there are calls for an optional protocol to the Convention on the Rights of the Child to protect children from harmful marketing, including alcohol marketing. And there are calls for a framework convention on alcohol control. These proposals are worthwhile considering the added value of a human rights-based approach in terms of accountability, empowerment, legitimacy, and participation. I don't have to go uh, time to go into the detail, but please uh, ask me later in question if you want me to elaborate on these points. So human rights have the potential to be transformative. However, the endeavor to develop an optional protocol or a framework convention will only succeed if the human rights and the public health communities join up their thinking effectively. And we haven't seen that yet in the alcohol space. A substandard protocol or a substandard framework convention would, in my view, be worse than no protocol or convention at all, as the inadequate standards that may come out of a process, if not uh, carefully thought out, could serve the uh, industry that would invoke these standards to, um, to serve their purely economic interest. So, we must align an optional protocol and a framework convention with the best evidence available and ensure that it serves its uh, purpose of promoting better health for all. And I will conclude by reminding us all that human rights are not optional. This is at the heart of a rights-based approach. They are anchored in law and we must use them better and more systematically. I thank uh, Marcello Campbell and Jaden Sauder, both at the University of Liverpool, for the research assistance they have provided. And finally, if any of the points I've made is of particular interest, please do not hesitate to get in touch. I'll be delighted to hear from you. So thank you very much for your attention. And I'll pass back the microphone to Leslie. Thank you so much, Amandine, and thanks so much to Sarah and uh, Olivier, who've given us really stimulating uh, presentations. We um, can have a round of virtual applause, um, but uh, it's now open for questions and comments. Um, I know that Wim van Dalen made a few comments on uh, Olivier's uh, presentation, and it actually relates to something Amandine made the point of the role of the state uh, behind the practices of corporations. Uh, Vim, I don't know if you want to uh, comment. You asked about uh, state subsidy to to uh, Heineken and how, and also the public perception. I don't know if you want to raise that point now. Go ahead. Yes, let's see. I think um, my my remarks were very clear. Um, it, I think one, two, three years. The publications of uh, Olivier had um, attention in the Dutch press and then also in the international press, but it just stayed there. And it's uh, for me unbelievable that it's very concrete, convincing details are not becoming politically relevant. So um, there's just a kind of remark and maybe all of you have some comments on that. And, and Vim, you also commented about the financial support from the Dutch yes. Ministry of Development Cooperation for yes. Heineken in African countries, which I think is quite important given what yes. Amandine is talking about. It's a suggestion that, uh, it's a suggestion that uh, the government has the, obligation to support uh, this kind of inf investments, to support farmers in poor countries. And that's, that's uh, yeah, it's unbelievable that it's politically um, accepted. Yes, um, thank you for your, uh, for your question, your comments, uh, Wim van Dalen. Um, yeah, it's true that uh, Heineken over the years has received uh, quite a number of, of subsidies for its African activities. 
it's uh, it's often programs to uh, sustain local farmers to supply to to breweries, and um, it is claimed to we to be a win 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 situation as it's often called. Uh, the Dutch state is is paying Heineken is is uh, buying the um, the local uh, supply. Uh, like like sorghum, like rice, like uh, corn, like maize. Um, so um, the farmers are better off. That's the idea. Uh, the, the Dutch state want to develop African countries, so they're better off. And NGA, NGOs bring in their expertise to uh, to uh, yeah to 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 guide the whole process. Um, the thing is that Heineken has actually uh, admitted that, of course, it's it's a multi-billion company. They don't need the, the support of the states. I've asked uh, the former CEO about this as well, and he actually said, well, as a company, you never refuse taxpayers money. You know, you're always, they, they have people uh, working for them to look for subsidies. You, you, you don't refuse free money. So... Um, and it's also very good for PR stories because uh, the idea is that you help those farmers, that local production gets up. It's good for Heineken because they pay their uh, they pay their their, their local uh, their resources at a lower price. But I actually found out that um, Heineken has set the ambition uh, of, of uh, sourcing 60% locally. Uh, that was uh, the ambition was set in 20, 2010. It was mentioned for the first time or 20, uh, 2009. And uh, 2020 would be the, the date where this target should be hit. But uh, I actually, uh, they have already um, told a lot of very positive stories about this. Um, that's they're helping so many farmers and our prime minister actually uh, Mark Rutte he even mentioned it at uh, at a meeting uh, of the the General Assembly at the United Nations he mentioned Burundi which was very ironic as well because it's it's such a horrible uh, well yeah there are horrible things taking place there and, and Heineken might be uh, as I mentioned complicit in those uh, crimes and happening there but the Prime Minister mentioned uh, the, the farmers that were supposed to be helped in Burundi by this this Heineken program and I found out that um, when Heineken set the ambition of 60 percent they were already, I think, at 49%, so 48% uh, of, of sourcing uh, materials locally. Uh, so it wasn't as, as huge as they claimed. It was only 12 percent points up. But in the end, uh, despite all the, the, the subsidies, also U, uh, USAID has also uh, given Heineken subsidies. Uh, they, they, there was UN funding. Despite all this public money in it, actually the percentage of, of locally sourced uh, ingredients uh, went down. Um, so <laughs> it, uh, it was always presented as a big success. Many press stories, uh, great PR. That's, that's what Heineken uh, says themselves as well. But the program didn't even work. So that was, um, yeah, quite something. Um, yeah, it's, it's true that uh, I think that, that my research has, has had quite a bit of, uh, of impacts. I think Heineken, to quite a few people in the Netherlands, at least the story, yeah, to too many people, some of the stories are known about Heineken in Africa. It's, yeah, I think it, there is something uh, that, that's stuck to people. I mean, they're not uh, taking fewer Heinekens for it, I guess most people, but, and they sometimes don't even know that, that, that all these brands are Heineken anyway. Um, and there has been, for example, there has been a bank that, that's, uh, that doesn't invest in Heineken anymore. But on a state level, it's it's true that uh, well, I think that it's, that maybe our Minister of Foreign Affairs is a little bit more wary of cooperating with Heineken again after all the revelations. But in general, um, yeah, it hasn't. There hasn't been any. Um, uh, yeah, any lawsuits against Heineken for for what they've done. Uh, there. So in, in that aspect, it's um, it hasn't changed so much. Thanks, uh, Olivia. Amandina, I wonder if you could just comment. So if the state is subsidizing a private entity that's doing this kind of practice, what is a human rights approach 
give civil society leverage to do in this situation? What can we expect of the Netherlands government in this situation? <laughs> because rights really apply to governments, right? Uh, it, it, it depends to a large extent on the national settings and the procedures in place in different countries. So, um, I, for example, uh, you know what I've discussed is what human rights law expects state to ensure happens within their own borders. Um, the, the, the compliance mechanisms in place at international level are notably weak. Uh, and that's why, in a way, you perhaps have less, you hear less about uh, human rights than you do about trade, because there are uh, more forceful uh, compliance mechanisms and an adjudication body, the World uh, Trade Organization Dispute Settlement Body, um, uh, to ensure that states uh, comply with WTO law and the various WTO agreements. Now, I I'm not avoiding the question. I'm just noting this very strong disparity that can explain why human rights have not gained the traction they should arguably gain in this field, number one. Number two, at, on the international plane, there aren't many robust mechanisms, but nonetheless, there are reporting obligations and states are scrutinized uh, by various human rights uh, bodies for and committees for uh, their compliance with human rights. So I think civil society would have, a, and academia would have a very strong role to play in hammering the message that uh, alcohol related harm should be framed as a human rights issue. And we see more and more of this in the food space uh, because I think to some extent, the, um, the framing has changed from uh, food being understood, unhealthy food environments being perceived not only as global health, but also as human rights concern. And human rights uh, based approaches have these advantages that they increase from this perspective, state accountability, because they are not based on charity or goodwill. They are anchored in legal obligations. And violating human rights and children's rights in particular uh, don't sound right at all. This is pretty bad. Whereas, you know, having levels of obesity may not sound as um, unforgivable from a state uh, than if they violate specific children's rights. Um, at national level, however, uh, again, you would need to look at the different contexts, but uh, the, the, there's the very interesting shell decision, um, fossil fuel decision in the Netherlands, where uh, the, the High Court, and uh, I have to say the document was made very quickly available in English, so thank you for that, it was extremely helpful. Um, the, 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 the High Court that heard the case where Shell was uh, um, sued for not having in place a plan to reduce its carbon footprint, um, the, the High Court used a provision, very generic provision of the Dutch Civil Code that it interpreted, if I'm correct, if I understand correctly, in line with the UN guiding principles on uh, human business and human rights. These principles, interestingly, uh, call for uh, corporations to respect human rights. This is a responsibility, not a legal obligation, but because uh, these principles were used to uphold the legal obligation in the civil code, then they gained indirectly uh, some legal weight. And this is the same sort of thinking that applies, uh, that we developed in this UNICEF report, where we argued that food marketing uh, recommendations are not legally binding, but nonetheless, if you use them to interpret uh, the right to health uh, and so on and so forth, then they should be much more impactful and uh, be uh, implemented seriously and effectively by states. Thanks, that's really helpful, Amandine, because I think you're pointing to the way in which we can leverage um, human rights documents that are not necessarily legally enforceable in ways to make them more relevant locally through uh, application of these principles, which are not yet in the form of a convention. Um, can I just ask, add one thing I, I should have said before, and again, it's uh, related to Africa, but I'm doing some work in, in Kenya, Uganda, and Tanzania, and there are mechanisms, for example, in Kenya, where individuals can invoke the Kenyan constitutions and invoke the right to information 
uh, directly before a court. So there are also mechanisms that allow individuals, standing rules that allow individuals to go before, uh, before national courts to uh, invoke human rights arguments. And there's quite a lot of strategic litigation led by associations like Kelly. Uh, in mm -hmm. this part of the world. So again, yeah. it, it varies enormously and I have not purported to provide uh, anything like a comprehensive answer. I wouldn't be able to anyway. Anyway, thanks for that. Um, I'm gonna direct one question to Sarah um, that came up in the chat. Um, and it's essentially a question about, uh, you, you spoke about the time bound way in which marketing changed you know, from earlier periods, the housewife serving beer to the housewife consuming and being active. I think the question is, um, to what extent does that reflect how alcohol companies respond to the environment or how, to what extent is it the alcohol companies shaping that environment, mm -hmm. being active mm -hmm. in shaping perceptions? Yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic question. And um, I, I, I think there's not really a clear answer. I mean, I think we see this, it's really interesting when you see the changes in marketing over time, because it really demonstrates the way in which <clears throat> the companies or their advertisers uh, <clears throat> are using gender in a very nuanced way that they're really responding to to changes. Um, but also, of course, they because they have such far reach now, I think they are playing a really significant role, perhaps a growing role in the construction of gendered norms. And one of the things I think that's really accelerated that, of course, is the rise of um, social media and digital media that we've gone from a period where a lot of advertising took place, you know, on billboards or in magazines. Um, so it had, you know, a, a certain amount of coverage. But now, of course, it's it's often taking for place on platforms that are very difficult to regulate. And Amandine talked about the, the issues with, um, Cross cross national regulation, where you know a, a lot of this material will be hosted in one country but viewed in another, and there's particular issues around children gaining access to these things. So I think the ubiquity of advertising and and also indirect forms of advertising on digital media, such as social influences, has a profound impact in terms of change of shaping expectations around gender um, and gendered norms. And uh, my sense is that, that that that's probably shifting to become a more significant form of harm that's arising from some of, of from some of these marketing strategies yeah and in a context where uh, many developing countries have low prevalences of drinking amongst women including south africa <laughs> where we are a high drinking country but it's a small number of very high drinkers and most women large majority of women do not drink there's a real market there waiting so industry is really pumping that market to, uh, yeah that i mean absolutely and if you look at the um if you look at the the, the industry documents that are produced for their for their shareholders, they are very clear in saying, I mean, so even some of the, the material I showed there, they are very, very aware of that. For them, you know, the areas where women are not consuming, that's a huge potential market for them. That's a huge consumer group that they can leverage. Um, and yeah, so I think it, it's, it, it's going to lead to, to some, some interesting targeting. I think it's also interesting in terms of how marketing engages with gender to see how the same company's product may be marketed in very different ways in different contexts. So of course they, yeah. they specialize their advertising according to the ge geography of the market that they're looking at. So in one context, they may be saying, you know, we're um, supporting this women's empowerment initiative and that the, exactly the same brand in different contexts may be using much more traditional um, gender norms. And so when you sort of see that contrast, you, you have a, a really clear sense of, um, what's what's the underlying objective, I suppose, and the extent to which it's a slight, it's a pretty cynical way of um, engaging with progressive gender norms. Sure. So there is a question from Oystein in the chat. Uh, I don't know if you want to ask uh, your question, Oystein. Thank you. Yes, I can do that. I'm Oystein Bakke from Forut in Norway and from the Global Alcohol Policy Alliance. Thank you for a very interesting uh, session. I just Having listened to this, uh, uh, I am reflecting that in about a week we are celebrating the International Women's Day on 8th of March. And we see a gradual increase in the industry, taking also an interest in that. It's a day to, to focus on human rights and particularly women's rights. Uh, and I would like to hear actually from all of the three presenters some reflections on that. How do Heineken uh, relate to this? How does this uh, view how how can we view this from a human rights perspective and of course sarah's approach is, is also interesting so i'm curious thank you 
Sarah? And I think it's a great question. I don't know that I have very helpful responses. I think, I mean, I think clearly the idea of International Women's Day is meant to increase the profile of, of rights as they relate to women. But I think we've seen a growing corporatization of it. And there's now a whole lot of um, companies, not just alcohol companies, but a whole lot of others that engage in corporate um, philanthropy around that and have really used it as a um, as a way of trying to promote their brands and their images, including companies that actually would be restricted from advertising, but who get quite good coverage through um, supporting activities that they claim are to do with women's empowerment. So I think, um, and there's other examples as well. I think International Women's Day is a really important one to pick up on because there's so much now that's done around that, but there are other um, causes, if you like, that have also become increasingly corporatized. And I think it's really, Difficult to know how to respond to that because often, often they are causes that are that are that are founded in human rights. Um, so a lot of the, the sort of LGBTI um, progressive movement has also become increasingly corporatized. And it's um, as I say, I, my sense is that it's because these companies recognise that in certain markets, it's very much in their, to their advantage to present themselves as supporting um, progressive norms. Even though, if you look at sort of their backstage activities, they are certainly not doing that in any real sense. Um, but it's in a sense these events become a bit of a um, a focal point, I suppose, for corporate activity. And it is hard to know how to to respond to that. Probably particularly for civil society organisations where. I think you know they're often offering um, financial support. You you were saying Leslie about getting the the email from Heineken offering, but you, well, I think if you're a very resource strapped um, NGO and and a company that you don't see as directly related to your cause comes along and offers to support something, it's very difficult to to turn that down. So yeah, I think it's a really good question. Okay, uh, Amandine, do you want to respond at all? Yeah, I mean, uh, it, it, it's it's the same as uh, the problem is the same in so many areas. This is the corporate social responsibility mantra where they appear responsible citizens, they want to promote uh, good causes, uh, but at the same time, they engage in uh, widespread violations of human rights, contribute to uh, planetary degradation uh, and um, bad health. So I think what we need to do is to expose the limitations of their corporate social responsibility to highlight that this is a form of marketing to promote their interests, but not at all the interests they purport to, um, to promote and defend. And if we want to be more specific, which I think we should be uh, in fighting back, is to say, well, there's a convention uh, against the discrimination of women and uh, the promotion of women's rights. These conventions, CEDAW, uh, contains uh, specific provisions that are relevant, including a right to health. And uh, therefore, we expose how uh, the industry uh, does, not, um, does not protect, uh, or sorry, does not respect this uh, right to health in violation of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights that expect that uh, uh, business actors, including the alcohol industry, will discharge their responsibility to respect human rights. So I think it's just constant advocacy to expose uh, the, the discourse that is just not consistent. And even if you look at human rights, they don't frame alcohol consumption as a human rights issue. But sometimes if you look at corporate documents, you'll have a passing reference or they're repackaging their drinks so that there's less of an environmental impact. This is a contribution to rights, uh, the right to a healthy environment. Yeah, maybe, but your core business really is the manufacturing and uh, marketing and um, um, uh, distribution of uh, harmful alcoholic beverages. And this is what we should be focusing on. In this respect, that's the last thing I will say, the Global Action Plan is uh, helpful because it really calls on the industry to focus on their core areas of activity. And this allows us as an advocacy community uh, or academic researchers to highlight that uh, focusing on other peripheral issues for these specific industry actors is not what is um, primarily expected from them. What I've seen from, from Heineken, which we, uh, I haven't seen any, for example, uh, marketing that was directly linked to International Women's Day. Uh, what I've seen in, in Africa, what's quite interesting is that 
many people tend to, especially in the middle class, tend to see Women's Day of International Women's Day as a as an occasion to take your wife to a nice restaurant and uh, give her a present, give her a gift. It's it's a bit like Valentine's Day. I don't know if that's really the the the, the, the purpose uh, of, of International Women's Day, but. Um, what, what I can say about, um, which is really in line with what uh, Sarah uh, observed uh, and then showed us, that there's a lot of, uh, especially last four or five years, I would say that Heineken is trying to, to get women uh, to drink, to really present some of their brands as, as female friendly, as some of them are very masculine, especially the, the, the darker beers, the stout beers, they're always related to, to virility, to, uh, to power, to, to, to supposedly masculine um, characteristics. But some other beers and they're introducing like, like Elsewhere in the world, they're introducing Rattlers, you know, with a bit of uh, juice in a bit of citrus uh, lime in the beers. They're introducing light beers uh, in Africa. They've been introducing them for in the last few years. So they are really targeting this, uh, yeah, this is this huge uh, untapped potential uh, of, of the women markets. Uh, thanks, uh, Olivia. I'm not sure we have much more time for questions, but I just want to draw an attention to a, a question that was posted in the chat about uh, shareholder action against pension funds investing in alcohol companies um, and, and cons uh, you know, uh, uh, shareholder activism. We've seen that a lot in the fossil fuel space, uh, but actually in South Africa, we have very large government pension funds. And I don't think we've actually looked at what government pension funds are investing and where they're investing. And that is also you know, part of the state obligation to make sure that its investments don't support industries that actually violate rights or end up violating rights. So that is an interesting question. Just to jump on this question of, of divestment, this is the term that's often used. Uh, it has been used a lot in the tobacco, uh, in relation to tobacco. It is increasingly used for uh, unhealthy food. There is some uh, um, uh, some efforts uh, to to uh, occupy this uh, this area. And again, why is alcohol not uh, considered? Uh, perhaps it is, but that's not something I've seen discussed. So again, it seems that we have the oddity of uh, one of the, the ill health risk factors being left out for reasons that mm -hmm. are probably more political than otherwise. So I think uh, we've more or less come to the end, and I really want to thank the three speakers for highlighting um, issues that are so relevant to our work uh, in the field. Um, uh, I think we've seen how uh, human rights approaches can give us leverage both within country and across countries. And the one point I think that came up that was mentioned that struck me in this discussion was how you know, we tend to work within our own silos. If we work in health, we think about health, the health system, and sometimes we think about social determinants of health. But a human rights approach really uh, affords us a whole of government approach. And I can think of our, our experience with social media uh, policy that recently a policy came out from the Directorate of um, Department of Communications, where we were able to intervene with a government department that would normally not be considered about uh, uh, considering health issues by inputting to the policy. Um, so I think it offers us much more intersectoral leverage to adopt a human rights approach. Um, I think as well, um, Amandine referred to some of the issues of holding governments accountable using national and international uh, systems. I know that when South Africa submitted its report to the Committee on Economic and Social Cultural Rights on progress on realizing human rights, social and economic rights, it made a big thing about um, its uh, policy, its legislation on alcohol advertising which ironically has been stalled for the last eight years because of political pressure. But our civil society and our academics can use that to leverage, put pressure on governments to fulfill their obligations uh, from a rights point of view. So I think this uh, webinar has been really helpful. Um, it it's actually shows how rights intersect with all the issues related to sustainability. The previous uh, webinars uh, looked at the sustainable development goals looked at the impact on the environment, looked at corporate social, corporate social responsibility, and all those issues have come up when we've been discussing today. So I think uh, human rights is really a cross-cutting consideration that can help us in many ways to tackle all these issues if we want um, 
uh, alcohol policies that are protective of health, protective of the environment. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to the speakers particularly. And thanks to you for attending. Thanks to the audience for the questions. And um, I think the IIS will be summarizing this in a report afterwards, and uh, it will be available on their website. Thanks so much.